four. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You are listening to the most informational packed hour of garden focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for taking time out of your day. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day and joining us to talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening through your radio on one of the 16 stations, our show is being broadcast across the United States in 2020 or through a radio app or the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, which is our website, and under the Season 4 tab at the top of the page. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. You can uh, find all of our programming at that said website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. And this program is about you, for you, to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, Grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener indoors and out, as well as preserving what you grow. There's a number of ways, number of ways in which you can contact us. And the first is you can send us an email at any time at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can also send us a tweet if you're on Twitter at TWVG show or hashtag TWVG. You can follow us uh, on our social media platforms. You just search the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener on anything, and you'll find us, as well as you can give us a call anytime, 24-7, at our number. It's 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. If we can't get you on the program, leave a message. We'll call you back and address and answer the question and what you called about. So uh, we're going to get in the program here. I wanted to give a shout-out to the listeners up there in the Boston area on WCRN Radio. We heard from a number of you last week from the program, and we want to just say hi to you, as well as everyone else that listens, uh, not only during our regular broadcasting schedule, but on podcast replay and in-studio video replay that uh, you can capture all the shows uh, on the, those platforms. We got a big show lined up for you, as we do every program. We don't go into a program going, well, we'll just slide through this one. We're going to be talking about how you can grow great tomatoes, as well as irrigation in the second segment. And our guest, she's an author and podcaster, Melissa Norse, will be with us and will answer your garden questions. So let's get into the topic of the program, the first topic, and that is growing great tomatoes, Holly. Most everybody that we know grows tomatoes, or 90-some-odd percent of people who garden grow tomatoes, either it's one or a hundred or somewhere in between, but there is some techniques. Tomatoes are not an easy crop to grow. No, especially in the Midwest or northern climates, because you're basically trying to grow a tropical plant in a non-tropical area. And tomatoes also can be, especially heirloom tomatoes, they can be a little bit tricky. Now, if you grow something like a hybrid you are usually pretty pretty good. Well, let's talk about where to start, because now here in the northern portions of the United States, uh, many of our listening areas, we're just getting to the point where we're getting very close to planting uh, tomatoes, and there are you know, other places that are listing that have already planted them. This is applicable for everybody. There are techniques in which you can exercise now, even if your tomatoes are in the ground, and also techniques in which you can practice and utilize before putting the tomatoes in the ground as well. So we'll start with seeds. Uh, you talked about heirloom and organic seeds, uh, hybrid seeds. You can, um, every, most everybody who starts a garden, they get a seed from or they get a transplant from their garden center or they start seeds indoors. However, you had a different upbringing uh, whenever you started the gardening, whenever you were a kid, Holly. Right. So I grew up in 
in Milwaukee, and we had a very small backyard. And How we, small was it? <laughs> it was like the size of a postage stamp. I'm not even sure. Probably 200. No, more than that. I don't know. Eight, 80 feet maybe by 20 feet. I don't know. Whatever. So um, it was not big. And to some we, people, that's pretty big, but well, yeah, go ahead. I don't think it was that. I don't, whatever. So, um, so we grew a four by four garden, four foot by four foot or so, and we grew a lot of things and we did not buy seedlings. I didn't know that seedlings were a thing that you transplanted. We just started our seeds right in the ground. So Memorial Day weekend, that's when we planted. You physically put the seed of the tomato, the pepper, the eggplant in the ground. There was no taking the seed, seedling out of a tray and planting it. No. Nothing. We you just, just got the seed packs from wherever. wherever yeah. Probably the one local independent garden center. And, yeah, that's what we what we did. Well, let's well, – okay. You, you can do that. However, transplanting you – can, You can do that. Now, if you – but the thing is, is that – and you failed to mention this because you're such a fan of seedlings. If you plant your seeds – in like in Wisconsin, southeastern Wisconsin, it's usually typically uh, Memorial Day weekend is when people plant their tomatoes. If you plant your seeds and you plant your seedling, they're going to grow at the same rate. They're going to typically produce at the same rate. Yeah, they're going to – because here's the thing. Let's say a tomato is 85 days to harvest. That's not 85 days from – six to eight weeks before your last average frost date when you started your seed in your greenhouse or in your grow room. It's 85 days from the time you put that seedling in the ground and then you put a seed in the ground. At 85 days, that's when the counter starts for both of those particular plants and they will harvest at the same time. The advantage to starting seeds or using seedlings uh, plant starts is you can see if the plant's going to be healthy, if the seed actually germinates, and you can get a good start, and then the counter begins on that. Well, what type of plants are best? Is there with the heirloom, organic, hybrid? But variety-wise, it really determines the geographical area in which you live. Example: San, what is it? San Marano. So San Marzano. Uh, they and even like Roma's Amish paste. Any of those paste. Tomatoes, they typically like more of a Mediterranean type climate. So, um, if you're not familiar with the Milwaukee area, it's on Lake Michigan. And where Joey and I live, we live very close to Lake Michigan. But where our big garden is, is more inland. It's probably about eight to 10 miles more inland. And so it's a little bit different climate. Um, as during the summer and spring and fall, um, it's typically cooler near the lake. So the closer you are to the lake, the cooler the temperatures are. And so that provides a different type of growing um, climate. And so you got to think about that. If you don't have success growing a certain type of tomato, don't feel like you failed. You, you, ha- you have to ask around. Mm-hmm. What works best in your particular growing area? Uh, and that's another thing. I mean, with anything, if you don't have success growing it, don't feel like you failed. But I think the biggest thing is when you're growing tomatoes is to grow a variety. Yes, you might want like all paste tomatoes, but if you don't have a plant that is acting or sorry, not acting, growing profi- prolifically and you're trying to grow only that type of tomato, you might be disappointed. So well, you want to try, especially if you're new to growing tomatoes, you want to try different varieties. And, and, and if you have the availability to grow 12 tomato plants, try to grow about three different varieties or four different varieties, a couple of each. And it just it, it morphs back to growing up on the farm. We would get seed corn, seed soybeans. It wouldn't be one variety. We would have six, well, I think five or six or seven varieties over, you know, the, the two or three or four hundred acres that we were planting because one was supposed to be drought tolerant. The other was supposed to be a heavy, you know, that type of thing. They're all hybrids and GMO seeds. But anyway, you didn't just buy enough for 400 acres of all one variety. You, and then sometimes in fields, you would plant different varieties in that field, uh, for a variety of different reasons too. So, uh, uh, the other thing that people get tripped up on when planting tomatoes is soil temperature. It's warm today. Let's put them in the ground, and then the next day it gets way, way cold. You have to look at the long-range forecast, and that soil temperature needs to be about 50 to 55 degrees minimum consistently at root zone. And I think the thing is is that a lot of people get excited, especially beginning part of May. If you're in a climate that typically you don't plant your tomatoes till after Memorial Day or around Memorial Day, you, you get, sometimes we get those like 
60, 70 degree days in the beginning of May. And then, or even at the end of April, right where we are now sometimes. And you're like, oh, I can plant my tomatoes. I can start a month early. But then the temperature tends to dip and there's still warnings of frost. And that's not good for your plants. So you want to plant them smart. You want to look at the long range forecast. You want to think about what you typically do year after year. And the old saying is I'd much rather plant my plants one time than the second time when my neighbor plants theirs the first time. So it's okay to wait because it will catch up to you whenever it gets, you know, the the tomatoes and peppers, they're going to sit there and just not do anything. And they're going to have to fight and struggle to keep them alive when you probably should have waited an extra week or two before that. Well, let's let's uh, let's go into some items when we get our tomatoes planted. We want to plant them deep. Unless you've got a grafted tomato. If you have a grafted tomato, those are more expensive. We don't really recommend grafted tomatoes, but I don't think that's really important because I don't know many people who plant grafted tomatoes. Well, we need to make that information. Well, right. Yeah. So this is plant them deep unless it's a grafted tomato. Right. So with that being said, when you when you plant them deep, Joey Explain your process. Uh, you want there's all, everywhere on the stalk of the tomato. You'll see hair follicles. Those can relate and develop into roots if soil touches them. So we want to plant them as deep as possible. About seventy five percent of the plant needs to go under soil. Whether you do the trench method, whether you dig a hole. Uh, if your plant is 12 inches tall and you dig a hole 9 inches deep and you bury the bottom 9 inches, whatever the case is, we want to get as much of the plant under the soil in order for it to develop roots because the more roots you have on the plant, the healthier and more uptake of nutrients that plant can provide and the more uh, energy it can be put into the fruit production. So we want to be aware of that. Also, when we're planting deep, uh, we want to remove the leaves and the limbs of those that will be under the soil level. Additionally, we want to pr- do some preventer, preventer, some precautionary measures, uh, meaning we want to mulch and we want to prevent or reduce early blight, which is the discoloration of the lower leaves on your tomato plant through the growing season. It progressively works its way up until the end of the season where you have no leaves, you have stalks, and you have fruit. And that's called early blight. It's in everybody's soil, and it's from the soil splashing up on the lower leaves, and then it works its way up. So by prevention measures, we want to mulch with a chemical-free seed grass clippings, straw, leaves, shredded paper, whatever, weed barrier, whatever we have in order to prevent that soil from splashing up. Additionally, we can use whole grain yellow cornmeal. Right, so whole grain yellow cornmeal. So this is the stuff that typically it's a little bit more expensive than just the cheap stuff. You just want to make sure on the bag or the box or whatever it says whole grain and it's yellow cornmeal. And so you want to plant, you want to put a handful around the base of your plant, around the time of planting, and then you can do this uh, when you get the first fruiting. And so when you do this, you, this has something in it called trichoderma, which is a beneficial fungi. Trichoderma is used in a lot of applications outside of the U.S. The U.S. just hasn't really become hip to it yet, but it does help prevent that early blight, and it has that beneficial fungi. So definitely you want to use that yellow whole grain cornmeal. And and there's many, many other things that we will get into throughout the growing season. But the main thing about all of this that we've given you, you have to take care of your plants. You just can't put them in the ground, water them, and walk away and go, okay, in 85 days I can harvest some tomatoes because that's not how it's going to work on any plant that you try to grow. There's much upkeep keep and care in which you need to uh, provide your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, everything in the garden. This is uh, something that you're working towards a harvest. And if done correctly, a cherry tomato plant can produce between four and 500 cherry tomatoes over a growing season. And a beefsteak or large tomato plant can produce between 25 and 40 pounds of tomatoes over a growing season. So that is just some of the growing techniques that will allow you to have healthy, big tomatoes in your garden this year, whether you're growing in containers, raised beds, or traditional ground garden. You also want to trim the bottom of the tomatoes as they grow up, about 6 to 8 inches from the ground level up the stalk to prevent the leaves from having an opportunity to pick up that soil that gets splashed up on them, as well as we want to cage the tomatoes 
by using metal cages or floor to weave or however we want to get them up off the ground because you'll lose 50% of the produce that those plants are producing if you do not have them elevated in some form or fashion. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our eighth show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? It was about vegetables you can grow in partial shade and things to know before buying plants at your garden center. And our guest was author Matt Manis. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we will make it even easier to find them. Send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com and put in the subject line show seven. And we will send you the link. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We will be talking about irrigation. You were listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow indoor and out. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. We here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens understand that healthy soil is always the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the micro life needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jim's will stimulate life in the soil and supply all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% bioavailable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. Chicken Soup for the Soil is an amazing fertilizer that will increase the quality of all the fruits and vegetables you grow. Perfect for gardeners, growers, and farmers. To find out more about Chicken Soup for the Soil and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Pomona's you Universal pectin is a high quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your your order. Dear Defeat, it can't be beat. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit IVOrganics.com. Responsible watering, accurate, fast, and efficient. Earth conscious. Visit waterhoop.com. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it. Tomatosnaps.com. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975 and today continues to provide those seeds to gardeners just like you with 600 plus varieties offered in this year's catalog and 18,000 listings on their exchange, their gardener to gardener seed swap. Seed Savers Exchange is keeping cherished seed varieties alive. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. 
When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for tuning in this week. We appreciate you, and we appreciate wherever you're listening and however you're listening to the program. It's always nice to hear from people who say, hey, I've listened to it, I'm listening to it, and we enjoy the content. It means a lot to us. Well, let's get into the conversation, Holly, of irrigation. This is something I think a lot of gardeners on many different levels uh, tend to forget about when it comes to making their garden successful. It's forgetting to... Well, I mean, not necessarily watering, but the the availability that is out there in order to make the job easier with a small investment. Right. And that's one thing is that you can grow, plant, whatever. You can weed. You can mulch. You can do all this stuff. But if you're not watering consistently, if you're not paying attention to the water, watering process, your, your garden, have enough water, things like that, it's going to become a problem. A, a plant that gets stressed because of lack of water is susceptible to disease and it's going to take more umph essentially for it to grow. Just like us humans. It sets we, back. It sets the plant back. It sets the plant back. Just like us humans, if we're dehydrated, you know, a lot of times we feel tired, fatigued, whatever. The same thing for your plant. So irrigation, first of all, is an investment. Mm-hmm. Um, you're gonna, you're going to pay for your irrigation up front. It's gonna last you a good free few years, but it is going to cost a little bit more. Um, during that initial investment, but that's just it. It's an investment. So if you're looking for a quick, cheap fix, irrigation is not for you. You're going to be disappointed right. because El Cheapo means not last long. Right. But if you're looking for, you know, I, I've established this area, I'm going to grow here for a number of years, then I would definitely invest in some irrigation, especially if you have varied um, waterfall uh, things like that. Now, we do have a couple of companies that are associated with irrigation in some form or another in, involved with water. Uh, Dripworks, they provide quality drip uh, equipment and irrigation systems uh, to people who want to reap the savings and benefits of using drip irrigation. We have Water Hoop, uh, number one rated sprinkler for watering trees, shrubs, gardens, flowers, multiple adjustments to that uh, and multiple uses, as well as the world's coolest floating rain gauge, so you know how much water you have, whether you need to turn the irrigation system on or not. Uh, it's a floating tube that uh, measures the rainfall, and it's a award-winning rain gauge. It's easy to read from a distance and fun to use. So three products there from three companies that support the program that have some association with water and water uh, usage or what you need to put on your garden. Now, some people might wonder, okay, so do I need to get like above ground sprinklers, soaker hose, mister, um, a direct drip, uh, what's it called? Direct drip irrigation. Drip irrigation. Yeah. So what's best for me? That depends on A, how much you want to invest and B, how big your garden is and also kind of how you have things laid out. Now with a drip irrigation at root zone, it will drip the water at a steady rate at a certain duration and it's more concentrated to the plant what, rather than an over the head watering system. Now there's nothing wrong with the water, overhead watering system. However, you, you can have the 
consistent the the, the the problem of water evaporating and you're losing a certain percentage of water that you were trying to get to the plants that it's evaporating because it's not at the root zone. And the old garden myth of, well, if the plants get wet in the sunlight, they will burn. That doesn't make any sense because it rains and then the sun comes out. And if that was the case, everything on this planet would be burnt up because the sun microscopically goes to the water droplet and burns holes in the plants and scars the leaves. It's not the case. So don't worry about that. But there is some... Uh, Things that you need to be aware of if you do above ground watering uh, late in the evening, based on the time of the year, the water can set on the leaves and call, cause mildew issues. Uh, so it depends on that. With you, when you do it at drip level at the root zone, you don't have to worry about water standing on or pooling up or getting on the leaves and potentially causing mildew issues or other diseases because it hasn't evaporated off before the nighttime falls. Right. So that's definitely something you want to think about. Is um, it's your leaves are not burnt from the the rain or water on the leaves. Yeah, Gar- so, garden myth there. Yeah, garden myth. Um, so no, another option uh, is a underground, such as an oya. An oya is basically a porous pot that you bury, and then you put water in it, and then it seeps into the ground as needed. Oyas are a really great idea um, if you if you keep up on top of them. That's why. Sometimes for us, as we have busier lives, people who have commitments after work or after whatever, um, work full time, what have you, volunteer, you know, sometimes you forget about watering. So something like an oil could be handy, just drip irrigation as well, whatever your irrigation is. Very handy. And these these systems uh, from Dripworks or from other companies, they can uh, be as expensive as you want them to be. Uh, and they are allowing, you have the option of having a manual timer, a timer, or a digital timer. So I would always advise to get a programmable timer if you're going to do this. That way it will, well, a manual timer is you, from one that I've seen, you crank to a certain time and it ticks back, and once it gets to the, the duration, it shuts off. But you manually have to do that. With a digital timer, programmable timer, you can set it to water X amount of time for X amount of minutes based on the capacity of that timer. Some can be 10 minutes every three hours or a certain time over the period of a day or every other day. And some of them, if you really want to go deep in your pocket and get fancy, some of them, they are hooked up to the weather system in your area and they won't water if X amount of precipitation has fallen in that particular area over a certain period of time. So it gets really scientific if you want to really get deep in it. But I would definitely recommend a programmable timer. And if you want to go to the next level and get one that hooks up to Wi-Fi to where you can turn it on and turn it off or, or all of that information is available and you can look at it. Uh, but definitely a timer makes the things a lot simpler. And when you put your irrigation in, you can go above ground. So, uh, on the ground or sub ground, you can, there's drip irrigation tapes and stuff where you kind of plow it in or, or notch it into the soil. Even with a drip irrigation system that is above ground, you can cover that with mulch. Right. There's a combination and of multiple things in which can be used here. So one of the, one of the benefits about drip irrigation is, um, that it goes directly into the soil. And if you want to get really fancy about it, I mean, you can line that hose up or yeah, they're basically hoses to go to around each plant, mm-hmm. and something like the water hoop is um, designed for that particular designed for that yeah. particular usage. So you can get really like precise with this, and I think for some people that is good, especially if you live in an area that might have a lot of droughting, you might have water restrictions, what have you. You can get precise right to the root of each particular plant if if you wanted to. But I agree with the mulching. The good thing about mulching, no matter what you're doing, if you're watering with a hose, watering can, irrigation, above ground, whatever, um, mulch helps keep that moisture in your soil. It also prevents stuff from splashing up on the leaves of your plants, which is good too, especially if it rains, um, especially if you get one of those big soaker thunderstorms. So mulch is good, and mulch helps keep that moisture in. It helps um, sometimes suppress weeds. Mimics nature. Mimics nature. If you go, out, if you've ever gone hiking anywhere, you go out. You don't see bare soil in the woods. You see the leaves that have fallen and the brush and all of that stuff. So definitely, I would recommend mulch. 
Absolutely. That, that's the way to go with, with that type of thing. Now, with a drip emitter, some of these can drip a half gallon an hour uh, based on the programmable system in which you have. Uh, soaker hoses, if you are concerned about what may be made of the ho- soaker hose, some of these soaker hoses are not safe to use. Uh, Because there are chemicals in which when you get down to it and you start searching terms, they're very highly toxic. And same as garden hoses. There are some garden hoses uh, that are not safe for, quote unquote, human consumption of the water that comes out of it. So keep that in mind uh, when you're doing that. Uh, Let's talk about rain barrels briefly. Rain barrels are not going to have enough gravity fed in order to uh, utilize in, in a irrigation system now you'd have to invest in some sort of pumping system but the nice thing about rain barrels is that you can if some people enjoy watering their gardens so you could you know one day or whatever not use the irrigation and water by hand containers you can can water containers yep you can maybe your vegetable garden is too complex but you could water your flowers Definitely, I would we would we would advise to use a rain barrel, utilize a rain barrel because there's many uses for that for that water. Uh, and whenever you do a rain barrel, put it up high enough on a pedestal in which you can utilize the gravity fed on it, so you're not trying to uh, fight with it in order to get the water out of it. So irrigation, take a look at it, see if it's something that works for you. Uh, They've got irrigation for containers as well as raised beds and ground garden. Well, it is warming up, and I know you want to make sure you can enjoy your yard without sharing it with beetles and grubs. Absolutely. Uh, with spring right about here in just a few days, if not already here for many of us, it's time to start thinking about how to control those beetles and grubs in your garden and your yard. Well, Grub Gone is here, and Grub Gone can be applied directly to the turf, garden, or around ornamental trees to control those grubs and lessen the impact of beetles that have been devastating your yard for years and your garden, and you can take care of it all summer long. It's easy uh, to use. It's biologically specifically targets grub and beetle invaders without harming beneficial insects such as bees, ladybugs, and butterflies. And to be honest, it's the only non-chemical that works. You can go to phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y. L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. It works very well, and it's organic, and you if you have not used it, you need to look into it. Well, we'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We will have Melissa Norris, author and uh, podcaster, with us. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow those trees healthier, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com. Tree Ripe Citrus Company has top quality produce that comes right to your neighborhood with the freshest peaches and blueberries you'll find. To find locations, go to tree-ripe.com. Do not settle for the rest when you can have the best peaches and blueberries with Tree Ripe Citrus Company. Go to tree-ripe.com. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. 
Simply Solar Greenhouse is a one-piece molded fiberglass greenhouse that is easy to install and maintain. Multiple sizes available. Check them all out at migreenhouse.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center is the place for all things gardening. We had another load of compost delivered to our garden this past week, and they are busy. So now is the perfect time to get your products scheduled for delivery on your property. They've got 40 varieties to choose from, from compost to wood chips to sand to gravel and everything in between, as well as their nur- their greenhouse, their nursery. Their greenhouse will be open in a matter of weeks. There will be some rules and restrictions on how to go in and purchase plants, but they will have that available. So so be looking for that. You can find all this at Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton in Greenfield. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220 and check everything out at bluemels.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for hanging around. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest this week. Melissa Norris is all about living homegrown, handmade, and modern day modern day homesteading. She is an author, blogger, and a podcaster. Welcome to the program, Melissa. Thanks. Excited to be here, guys. Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join not only Holly and myself, but all of our listeners from across the country that tune in to our program. Yeah, I love talking about this and helping other people, so I'm ready. So let's start with this. What is a modern-day homesteader, and can you can anyone be a modern-day homesteader? I know with this type of situation that we're currently living in, many people are figuring out that they're something that maybe they never knew they were uh, to, a, to a prepper or a homesteader or a survivor. I don't, I don't know what we want to deem that as, but what is a modern-day homesteader? So I classify a modern-day homesteader as someone who is looking to be as self-sufficient as possible, and that is growing their own food, making homemade items, not buying it from the store, but still using modern appliances, I mean, modern things to a degree. So it doesn't mean you have to live totally off-grid, that you aren't connected to society, that you live way up on a mountaintop and that you never come down. And so yet anybody can be a modern-day homesteader because honestly, homesteading is a, a mindset first, and you can homestead anywhere that you live. Now, if you live in an apartment, high five to my apartment homesteaders, you might not be able to raise livestock. You might not have acreage to do as much as someone else, but there's all things. I mean, everybody, no matter where you live, there's things that you can do. And for a lot of people, that's going to start in the kitchen. And a lot of people right now are realizing this. There isn't homemade. I mean, there's not homemade bread on the store shelves, amen, but there may not be bread even on the store shelves. There may not be some of those in in things that people are used to buying or for states who have shelter at home things, they're not supposed to be going out to the stores as often. And so people are having to learn to make homemade versions more so than maybe they ever have in the past. So anybody can start in the kitchen with homesteading and creating more of their own food and doing it from scratch, but even in apartments, you can raise, you can do a vegetable garden in pots. You know, it may be a few herbs just on the windowsill if you don't even have a balcony, but you can do something. And that's the thing. I was watching a, a YouTube video of, of a home, homesteaders in the Ozark area, and they said, this really hasn't affected us because we don't go to town. We only go to town about once every 45 days anyway. Uh, so it really is nothing new to us and we work from home. So, uh, nothing new, but there are people now realizing, uh, in the state that we are in, uh, the conditions that, you know, I have to buy more. I need to prepare because otherwise prior to this, just went to the store every other day to grab a few things and, and never was, Hey, I need to buy enough for a week or two weeks or X amount of weeks in advance. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people are running into that and then they're like, okay, we want to have this item. It's not at the store. I can't go to the store to get it. 
And so they're now looking for ways to make it at home. And, you know, we live pretty rurally and I try not to go to the store usually like two times a month. And I ha- I've got kids and, and things and they've got normally they have outside outside activities. So I'll be going to different sporting events. But my goal is to only go grocery shopping once or twice a month. And that's mainly for perishables. One of the only things that we're not self-sufficient with here on our homestead is they don't have a dairy animal. We raise all of our own meat and most of our vegetables and fruit. But I do go and get milk and cream and butter because I consider those definite essentials. Um, but yeah, it's having, uh, you know, stocking up and you really don't have to stock up on as much stuff as people think. If you've just got some basics, there is so much that you can make with just a few basic things like flour. You don't even have to have store-bought yeast. You can use flour and water to make a sourdough starter and make your own homemade yeast. And then if you've got water and salt, you can make quite a few different types of breads. And then if you just have a little bit of fat and an egg, maybe a little bit of butter or coconut oil, I mean, you're pretty much set to bake and make almost anything that you would normally be buying from the store. That's pretty amazing. Now, even if somebody lives in an apartment or has very little space to grow, what can they do to have their own little homestead where they do um, have some self-sufficiency with vegetables or fresh, uh, yeah, some fresh vegetables? Yeah, well, one of the things is, and almost everybody can do some type of herbs. Herbs are great because they don't, you can do them in a very small pot. I've actually grown basil in the winter months just inside a quart size mason jar. <laughs> so I say that you can do herbs and herbs are great because they offer so much flavor for being a small plant. You usually only need a couple of teaspoons, maybe a tablespoon of fresh to flavor an entire dish, but it will really one, it gives you some fresh greens and nutrients, and you can do it in small amounts of space. And you can get a harvest relatively fast with things like basil. You plant them from seed, and they're going to be providing for you within a month or so. Some other things that you can do if you live in an apartment or even in a small space, and we even do it in the winter months because we're so far north here that there's I can do very few things with that, even with cold frames, is microgreens and sprouts. So you can grow sprouts in a mason jar with just some water and have sprouts, which are fresh greens, ready to go in just three days' time, no dirt. And microgreens you can plant in just a shallow, I just use old lettuce containers and you buy lettuce from the store and you know they have those like clamshell tops. I save those and you can grow microgreens in them. You can use a bread pan. You just need about two inches of dirt and you spread your seeds on top and you water it and Usually within two to three weeks, you've got microgreens that you can start harvesting and putting on sandwiches and in salads, in the casseroles and soups, but it provides you with those those fresh greens. And you don't even really need a grow light. A sunny windowsill will work for microgreens. Now, for microgreens and uh, sprouts, what varieties of plants are we utilizing, or can it be anything, or is there certain guidelines that one needs to follow? Yeah. So the beautiful thing with doing microgreens is you can really do any type of seed. A lot of people like to do sunflower seeds. Peas are great because if you do pea seeds, those are one of the few microgreens that you can clip off the tops and they will continue to produce for you. A lot of the microgreens like the sunflower seeds, um, broccoli is another one because broccoli sprouts have so much nutrients packed into them and vitamins. But really any seed that you want, you can do. They're not going to say like microgreen specific. You're just harvesting them when they are a small green and just have a few leaves on the top and they're tiny and tender, which is why we call them microgreens. So really anything, if you like beet greens, you might want to do beet seeds. Some people like a little bit of radish or even mustard greens because they can have a little bit of a bite and more flavor to them. But really pretty much any seed will work. Okay. So you have a new book called The Family Garden Plan. What is the book about? And do you have a particular notable part of the book or your favorite part, something you want, you know, uh, yeah, notable part? Yeah, I do. My So my new book is The Family Garden Plan, and it teaches you how to grow a year's worth of sustainable and healthy food. So one of my favorite parts and one of readers' favorite parts is the charts. So I have a ch- charts in there that walk you through exactly how many plants per person of both fruit and vegetables you need to plant and grow if your goal is to have a year's worth of that food. And so especially in in this time right now when a lot of people are really looking to grow more of their own food than they ever have before, it's perfect because you don't have to guess how many plants do I actually need if I wanted to not buy this from the store and and be self-sufficient with this item. 
all of the worksheets and the charts are there for you. So you come away with a plan of exactly how much you need for your family. And it all helps you tailor it to your growing area and your growing space. So it, it's universal in that, but it teaches you how to customize it all for exactly the location that you are in. Now, I don't want to categorize it, but but you can correct me if I'm wrong. So it's kind of like a modern day victory garden plant to chart what you need and how much to grow. Yes, that is a perfect way to put it. You nailed it. It is. Yes. Well, let's talk about this. You grew up in a homestead, but your spouse did not. What advice do you have for those who are in that mixed matched relationship of somebody who understands how to prep, but the other one kind of grew up in the city and, and not is not familiar with that type of, of lifestyle? Yeah. So my advice to new vegetable growers, or even if you, like you said, maybe you have someone who's got more experience and one is not, is one, not to overwhelm yourself. And I know I'm talking about growing a year's worth of food, so that might sound almost contradictory, but really focus on a couple of key crops and how you pick those key crops is for me, is it's vegetables or fruits that you eat, your family likes, and you eat on a really consistent basis, because that's going to have the most impact one on supplying your own food, because it's something you eat all the time, and you know your family likes. So I narrow it down that way. And then secondly, and I go over this in the book as well, is picking those crops from those that you eat a lot that are going to grow well easily in your area and in your climate. So if you're really north, trying to do sweet potatoes is probably not going to be your best bet because you're likely not warm enough. I'm not warm enough for sweet potatoes, vice versa. You know, if you live in the south, then you're probably not going to want to do something like snow peas or things that really like those cooler weather. So people, myself included, we don't have, you know, a lot of extra time, even in with the stay at home orders that we're in. And you don't want to be having plants that you really have to struggle to keep alive and and battle. You want things that are going to flourish in your area. And when you have success and it's things your family likes, then that gets people who maybe haven't done it before. Maybe they're not quite as on board with it. um, Then they start to get excited. And if it's easy, and it's not something everybody's dreading or battling against. It's easier to pull everybody in. And then it makes the biggest impact as well on your, your grocery bill Um, And you're eating those homegrown nutrients and those foods that have higher levels of vitamins and nutrients, which we all are looking to stay healthier right now. Um, And homegrown provides that because it's you harvest it right from the vine and you cook it. And the longer any food has been picked and is shipping or sitting on a store shelf, it degrades and begins to lose its nutrients. And, and you bring up a good point. One, grow what your family eats and, and what you, you eat the most. But also, this might not be the year to uh, experiment with 15 new varieties of this, that, or another. You need to stick with what you know has been very successful and prolific and, and utilize that for this year. Yeah, yeah. This year is not the year to gamble. Yeah, definitely, definitely stick with those staples. Okay. Now, where can we find out more about you and your other books? Yeah, well, at my website, which is melissaknorris.com, as well as my podcast, which is the Pioneering Today podcast, is another great resource to get information and to find out more things as well. And I forgot to say, my book, The Family Garden Plan, at thefamilygardenplan.com, the book website, you can get a free copy of that chart on how much to plant per person, and you can snag it there. Well, there you go. And and just because it says homesteader, in the title of what you do does not mean that urban or city dwellers should shy away from this uh, this book and, and the information you have to provide for everybody. Oh, absolutely not. This really will is your is your plan is your game plan. It's going to walk you through every step from planning, like we talked about today, to then actually planting it, harvesting it. Every single step along the way, this walks you through full season. Well, Melissa, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your very hectic schedule there uh, and informing and enlightening Holly and myself and all of our listeners about things and, and, and how to plant for what we want and how much to plant for a family, which is very important uh, this time of year in this situation that we're currently living in. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on and, and for helping others to grow their own food, guys. Absolutely. Thank you. 
And when we come back, it's going to be all about your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Dreaming of a lush green lawn and abundant garden? Not sure what products you need? Check with Chapin. From sprayers to spreaders to fertilizer injectors and greener gardening options, Chapin offers the products you need to weed and feed your lawn and garden. Feed your plants every time you water with Chapin's HydroFeed Fertilizer Injector. Weed a greener way with Chapin's Horticultural Vinegar Sprayer. Check with Chapin. Visit www.chapinmfg.com. Ship Drop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, Ship Drop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Conserve water, save time, reduce runoff, eco-friendly. Visit waterhoop.com. Grow, 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 grow. Give your plants what they need. Neptune's harvest. Grow, oh, oh, grow, grow, grow. Hello, gardeners. It's Anne from Neptune's Harvest Organic Fertilizers in Gloucester, Mass. Neptune's Harvest shows amazing results on everything you grow. Grow, 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 grow. With Neptune's Harvest, the results will show. Show, show, show. This ain't no jive. With Neptune's Harvest, your plants will thrive. We're not kidding. Your garden will be award-winning. Neptune's Harvest is available at your local garden center or grow store. To learn more, go to NeptunesHarvest.com. Grow, grow, grow. Neptune's Harvest. Stay tuned and you can win a gallon of Neptune's Harvest Liquid Fertilizer, a $50 value following the commercial break. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Had a great show so far. Going to get to your garden questions momentarily. You can find all the information out about what we do and all of our programs and past shows at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. That's where everything is located. Well, during the break, you heard that you could win a 
prize package from Neptune Harvest. Holly, what is the rules, regulations? And then I will give the question and tell them how they can enter to win. Sure. So it's open to listeners 18 years and older living in the contiguous United States. The prize will be shipped to you. This ends on April 30th. Um, at 9 a.m. Central Standard, Central Standard Time. Time. For the details, go to wisconsinvegetablegardener.com and click on the giveaway tab at the top of the page. To enter the chance to win, you must email gardentalkradio at gmail.com with the correct answer. And in the subject line, put enter me. No purchase necessary. He will receive one gallon fish and seaweed blend, one four pound bag crab and lobster shell blend, one four ounce best yet blend. Biting insect spray, also a shirt, a hat, two koozies, and two stickers. How does that sound? It's a hundred fifty dollar value. The question is, what is a garden myth that you have heard and uh, that you know is not true? To enter, you can send one garden myth, and you can email gardentalkradio at gmail dot com with your name and the answer, and the drawing will be. Uh, this Thursday. Okay, let's get to some questions, Holly. If you want to send a question, you can do that at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. If you catch the carrot tops going to seed, can you remove the flower heads? Will it force the plant to send more energies to the carrots underground? Uh, no, because once the carrots have gone to... Uh, seed or sprout, or the, the seed heads, it, they've already been in the ground too long. They're already changing their chemistry inside of the carry itself. And if you cut the top off, it's not going to revert into a carrot in which you can utilize. Uh, they're already, already beginning to focus on seed production rather than the, the root of itself. Okay. So Kathy asks, is there a bagged type of compost you recommend to use in a raised bed? Um, so you want to get a raised garden bed mix if possible. Um, it's similar to a potting mix. If you make your own raised garden bed mix, you would use 50% of like uh, a garden soil, um, 50% potting mix for a good drainage and aeration. Um, you could take something like yeah, the, a the- compost and then mix that with a topsoil with maybe some vermiculite, a little bit of sand, just depending on what you want to grow also. But just for a good raised bed mix, you want to do raised bed mix or even just a potting soil mix. I want to go back to the carrot question and and clarify. Carrots go to seed in the second year. However, if the it's extremely hot and the temperatures are stressing the carrots out, then it will go to seed, and you want to keep the carrots watered, and they take about 70 days to reach maturity. If you let them set there for 90 days, you're going to see this occur even in the first year. So keep that in mind, um, that it will occur even because they're sitting in there too long and they haven't been harvested. Okay, so I have six four-by-eight-foot raised garden beds that were put. I put them in about five years ago. I was afraid to use treated wood, um, but now the carpenter ants love this wood. They're eating them up. So should I use something like um, PVC planks? Some, you know, treated wood still has some of it, has some warnings. What should I use? Well, PVC planks will work. Now, that is the compressed plastic material that a lot of times are used for decking and other uh, construction projects. And it will work. There are a, a lot of raised beds that are made out of this material. What I would advise is to shy away from uh, dark colors because that's going to absorb heat and radiate it into the soil and cause the soil to dry out quicker in the hot portions of the summer. So I would recommend a lighter color, a white, uh, a grayish color. Try to avoid the black, dark colors that's going to really radiate heat into the soil. And in that can, even if you're watering, that can, you know, accelerate the heat in the soil and can cause problems with your plants because a lot of plants react to soil temperature, not necessarily ambient temperature. Okay, so what is the best way to harvest microgreens? Will they continue to produce as you harvest them? Uh, microgreens, you just want to cut them off after about two or three weeks of growing. They're going to be about two or three inches tall. And uh, peas are about the only microgreen that if you do cut them off at that height, they will regrow. But it's basically a, a one-and-done deal. And you'd want to take an 11 by or 10 by 20 tray and plant the in succession so you don't have a whole tray of microgreens at one time. You could do it in thirds, and that way you can have a little harvest uh, 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 sustainably throughout a certain duration of time. Um, so Emily asks, my beets 
say they tolerate frost, but if we need it a certain temperature to germinate, should I germinate them inside, put them outside in the chilly weather as soon as I see the green buds so the green buds can be exposed to 30, 40 degree weather at night? Um, no. Uh, you can start beets inside. We've done that. And then transfer them outside and through the hardening off procedure at the correct time. By doing this, you're going to actually put the plant more in a shock than anything because you're taking it from, let's say, 70 degrees and then transitioning out to 40 degrees. The best thing you can do with beets is go ahead and plant them in the ground. We've done it this week. The soil was a little on the cold side. However, in nature, the seed is going to set there until the temperatures are adequate, and then it's going to sprout. So don't worry about starting it indoors, and then as soon as you've seen it sprouting, get it outside. Just go ahead and direct sow it. Uh, and when I say when the temperature is adequate, I'm not saying the soil is 26 degrees. Let's go ahead and plant the seeds now, and then when it gets warm. I mean, if, if the seed needs to be planted at 50 degrees and it's 42 or 43, yeah, it's fine. Go ahead and put it in the ground, and then when the temperatures warm up, they will uh, grow and germinate just fine. One more question, Holly. Um, Bud writes in, I'm growing tomatoes in fabric bags this year. What model drip system do I need? Well, uh, we talked about a little bit in the second segment. Uh, Dripworks, they have a number of, uh, they have a couple of drip irrigation kits for containers. And uh, they have one that has a the timer or without with a timer or without a timer, and it can do up to twenty pots. And you can go to dripworks.com and look at their patio selection. I believe it's called uh, a container irrigation system, or deck garden irrigation system is the correct term that you would search for. And they can uh, set you up with anything and everything that you possibly could imagine in regards to irrigation for your containers that will work in the containers, the raised beds, and traditional ground. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your day. We are out of our, we are out of time and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it, you can do that by going to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and clicking on the radio season four tab at the top of the page. Or we can make it easy for you. Send us an email at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com and we will send you the link to the show and if you're missing past shows, we can get you caught up on that, as well as we have in-studio video of each program as well. Tell your garden friends that this program is on the radio and podcast, because that's how our message gets shared to the world. Join us next week. On the show, we'll be talking about five good bugs you want in your garden and also five bad bugs you, you really don't want in the garden at all. And we'll talk farmer's markets. Our guest will be our garden trend expert Kate Dubois will be with us and will answer your garden questions. And until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.